We are so pleased and honored to have Karen Allen with us this evening, and we're going to start right at the very beginning. You were born in Carrollton, Illinois, population about 2,500 today. Is that correct? Yeah, I haven't kept up with their population, but uh, um, yeah, it was a small town. It was a little town. Your mother was a university professor, your father an FBI agent. How would you describe your childhood? Uh, well, my mom wasn't a university professor. She was an elementary school teacher, but she did go back to school when she was well into her 30s and finished college in order to get her degree in education. And um, how would I describe my childhood? Is that what you said? Yes. We moved around a lot when I was young because my dad joined the FBI the year I was born. So we were moving. I think for a while there, he was changing offices almost every year until I was maybe 10. And then we ended up in Washington, DC. And he, he had the rest of his career there. So that became, for a period of time, my home. And uh, I moved to New York when I was 17. But I have two sisters. And because we traveled so much, we were a fairly tight knit family because we were kind of all each other had. We were constantly pulling up stakes and, and moving elsewhere, so. And so my next question is, did you watch a lot of movies as a kid? Um, I don't know if I watched them so much as a kid as maybe by the time I was getting into my early teens and I became particularly a film lover by the time I was, when I lived in Washington, D.C., there were, I was near George Washington University and I was a student there for a while and down the road there was a, a film theater called The Inner Circle, The Outer Circle, and uh, The Circle. And The Circle had two classic American films. You paid a dollar and you could go in and see two classic American films. The Inner Circle was two classic foreign films and you could pay a dollar and go in and see those. And, and the outer circle was modern foreign films, like recent foreign films. And they, these theaters, two of them were in the same little building together, and one of them was just you know a few blocks away. And we used to, or I used to, I don't know whoever was my partner in crime with this, but I would pack a sandwich in my purse, I would pay my dollar, I would go in and see the two American classic films, and then I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd come back out, and I'd go into the other <laughs> and sit and watch four films in a day, which was my, my film education, really. Um, and so did one of those films really impress you? Was one of those films your favorite? You know, I remember really, truly falling in love with Fellini, Ingmar Bergman. Liv Ullman, I think, became sort of my you know, the actress who I was most moved by at that time, B.B. Anderson. Um, there were just, and there were a lot of wonderful female directors that were working internationally, not so much in the United States. So I was always very interested to see what they were doing as well. But before you got really interested in theater and film, you were interested in something else. You actually studied something else first. Tell us about that and what led you to that discovery. Well, I was, I got interested in design. I, my grandmother, who lived in this little town, Carrollton, Illinois, um, she was one of these extraordinary women who, she knit constantly things. She knit the most beautiful things. They were constantly pouring out of her hands. I'd go to bed at night as a child and I'd wake up and there would be lined up all these incredible things she had made during the night. And she would just give them away to sort of church bazaars and things like that and, and help you know people raise money for various projects and things with them. But she, I was so impressed by her and I thought she was so magical. And she taught me how to knit when I was a kid. So I developed this love of making things with one's hands and I, I became really a very good knitter uh, on my own. And I got interested in design. So I, when I went away to school, I went to New York when I was 17 to the Fashion Institute of Technology to study design. That was my first thought about what I might do with my life. I had no interest in acting whatsoever in school, in high school. or Didn't even 
um, participate in any plays. No, never, I never. Was, I was a little scared of the people who were in the theater programs. They were just like a little extroverted for me. <laughs> <laughs> they seemed so confident in themselves, and and I just didn't feel like I fit into that world so much. But somewhere along the way, things changed, and if I. If what I read was correct, because clearly not everything I read about you was correct, but if everything I read is correct, you saw a production that really changed your mind. Tell us about that. I did. I was 22, I believe. I had I had taken this incredible trip when I was, I guess, 20. I went um, to live in the West Indies just because I had fallen in love with it. and. Um, and then two friends of me invite two friends of mine invited me on a trip to go from Mexico City to southern Peru by car. And I thought, whoa, that would be a really interesting thing to do. And I had saved up a little bit of money. So I flew to Mexico City, I met them, and I spent a year on the road with them. And it was really an illuminating experience for a young person. Um, I, I learned Spanish, I learned about all these different cultures we were traveling through. And then I came back to live in Washington, D.C., and I had only been there a couple of weeks when a neighbor, we shared windows that were kind of catty-cornered to each other in these brownstones near DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., and um, we got to know each other through the windows. And he said he was the director of a theater company, and I didn't really even understand what that was. But he said, my teacher is coming to the United States and I want to invite you to come see a performance that they're giving. So I said, sure, I'd love to do that. And I think I had maybe seen one play in my life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when I lived in New York, somebody took me to the public theater and I saw a play called Short Eyes, which was extraordinary. But um, uh, so I said, yeah, I'll come to this. And, and um, we got in a car with a bunch of the actors in his company, drove to Philadelphia, walked into a, a church, big empty space. We all sat on the floor in a circle and into the room came six Polish actors who were a, a member, members of the Polish Theater Laboratory directed by a man named Jerzy Grotowski, who unbeknownst to me, it was the singular most celebrated theater company in the world at the time. Wow. Uh, he had written a book called Towards the Poor Theater and there were, you know, he never worked with any um, kind of sets at all. It was all about the actors. And he called his actors acrobats of the soul. Mm -hmm. And he, they trained 12 hours a day for, you know, years at a time to prepare for performances. And out to this room came these six actors. And for the next two hours, they spoke completely in Polish. I didn't understand a word. But what they were doing was so, it's so transcended language. And by the time this performance was over, I was a different person. It's hard to explain, but something shifted in me. And I thought, I don't know what those people were doing, <laughs> but whatever it was, I want to be a part of it. And I said to my friend later, does your theater company do anything like what I just saw? And he said, yeah, I trained with these people for six years in Poland. And I said, could I come and see what you do? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, do you ever train actors? He said, yeah, we, we have a program where we train actors. Would you like to be a part of it? And I said, I would. And he said, well, you have to audition. And I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what an audition was. He had to explain to me that I had to memorize something that had some meaning to me. And then I came in and I would present it to them and they would decide whether or not they thought I you know, could be you know, a part of their company. So that was how I started. And what, I was, what, did, what was your audition? It was a, it was a, a poem. Actually, it, wasn't a, it was a radio play that Sylvia Plath had written called Three Women. And it was about three women who were all in a hospital about to give birth to a child and their circumstances were all radically different. And I, I chose one of those women and memorized this long model book of hers. And that's what I did for them. What an amazing story. <laughs> and so all of the anxiety you had about acting before just disappeared? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
No, it took me years. I had great um, uh, stage fright for a long time. I mean, I would stand off stage. I, I did plays with them, and I would stand off stage just like shaking. And then usually like once I got on the stage and once I entered the story of the play and once I was in relationship to the other actors, a kind of calm would come over me and I would feel really, you know, like I had stepped out of myself. And so a lot of the anxiety was particularly mine and it what didn't belong to the character. So I did learn how to let it go. Um, how long did it take you to reach that point? You know, I, I think the real moment was years later when I was in New York City. I did a play called Extremities, and I remember standing in the wings, and I remember having this kind of luminous thought suddenly, because I was standing there again, like very nervous, and um, something in me said, nervous anxiety and excitement are the same thing. It's the same energy. Mm. And when you think of yourself as being nervous and anxious, you're naming it in a way that you feel like it's something you shouldn't feel. But if you named it excitement, then it would be a different thing for you. So, because you would think of it as positive, like I'm excited to go on. Not that I'm nervous to go on or I'm anxious to go on, but that I'm excited. And suddenly something shifted in me and I just felt that feeling that I've always thought was negative. What if it's positive? What if it's a good thing? What if it gives me the energy to do what I'm doing and I'm just sort of getting in my own way with logistics in a sense or with, what do you, what's the right word? Uh, with language, you know, that language was getting was creating a negative where there was a positive. I like that, I like that a lot. You did a lot of work at the Washington Theater Lab before joining um, Shakespeare and Company in Massachusetts and you moved back to New York to study at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. Why did you choose to study there? Well, I actually, I had had such, so this Polish theater company, it they had very, very uh, eccentric approach to acting. It was uniquely, their uh, way of training actors, and I loved it. However, it had its own language and vocabulary and way of working, and I thought if I was gonna move to New York and really want to work more in, in the more traditional uh, theatrical world, that I should you just broaden my, my, my uh, knowledge. So I studied at the Strasbourg Institute because I was interested in, in what the method was and what how they approached acting. And I studied with Stella Adler, who was a very celebrated teacher at the time, who had a slightly different approach. She was amazing, like taking plays and, and really tearing the play apart and, and creating uh, an understanding of, of what the playwright was doing when they wrote the play. And, and the place and the time period and the history of the play. And there was, I still had so much to learn. I mean, um, you know, I still feel like I had so much to learn. But um, so yeah, that was my, my, my entry coming back into New York, having been away for a few years because I'd gone to school there. So I, I already knew the city a bit, but I came back wanting to do something quite different with my life. How did your family feel about you switching to acting? Um, I don't think in their wild, so in my family, we had never met anyone who was an actor. I, in fact, I went off to do my first film and I had never met an actor who had worked in a film. I had never met anybody who had worked on a film. So, you know, I was really walking into uh, some unknown territory. And um, I think my parents kind of hoped I would get over it, you know, like I'd get over it and move on to something else, you know, and they were always saying, what's your plan B, what's your plan B? And I kept saying, I, I don't really have a plan B, this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> your first major film debut was in Animal House. How did that come about? Well, that's a really interesting story. I was, at, I was studying at the um, Strasbourg Institute and one day I was leaving, walking out the door, and I just glanced up at a bulletin board that was right by the entrance door, exit door, 
And there's a little three by five card that said feature film, casting college age actors and actresses send picture resume to. And I was maybe 25 or 26 at the time, but I looked young. People were always telling me I looked young. And so I thought, well, you know, I wrote down the address and I stuck a picture and a resume. My resume was like only kind of very obscure plays. And my photographs, I didn't really know anything about a photograph. So I had four photographs on a page of me in four experimental plays. And they were all a bit eccentric. And, and I just stuck it in the envelope and I sent it off. And sure enough, in a couple of days, I got a phone call and they said, we would like you to come to this address. They gave me an address on Park Avenue in New York and, um, and meet on this film project. So I showed up and I walked in and this woman came walking over to me and she said, I know you don't have an agent, I know you're not in the union, but you're coming in to meet the director because you're my girl. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Can't, can't, can't be anything wrong with that. Um, so I went in and she introduced me to John Landis, who is the director of Animal House, and Harold Ramis was there, and um, another casting director from California was there, and it was a very lively, interesting group of people, and we chatted, and they knew I had never done a film before, although I did have a little NYU film. You know, I'd done a little short film with some NYU students, and I think I, I sort of said, you know, I would send them a copy of that or something, and what it was terrible as I remember it. But um, I went back and I auditioned, I think, three times for Animal House in New York, and then they decided they wanted to fly me to Los Angeles, and they wanted me to audition in front of the executives at Universal, which scared me to death. And How did you hold it together? I didn't. I was really nervous. <laughs> I was really nervous. And, I really thought I gave a terrible audition, and it turned out the funny story is that it was down to me and one other girl, and she had done a lot of television. But for some strange reason, I don't know if you guys know Animal House, but there's that scene. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a, my character's first, you know, one of her big, she comes out, and Peter Riegert playing Boone sort of follows her out, and he says, oh, you know, boy, don't be angry. Why don't you and me and some of my friends go up to your parents' cabin? And, and um, there's this whole little scene where, you know, he's trying to make up with her, and she's having none of it. And the other actress, couldn't or wouldn't do that scene without crying. Oh. And honestly, it never occurred to me <laughs> that that was the scene one would cry in. So I didn't cry at all. I was just trying to play it more for, I guess, the realism or the comedy of it or whatever. And John Landis kept saying to her, don't cry in this scene. And then they do it again and she'd cry again. So I kind of got that first role by default because she, she couldn't do it without crying. Wow, that's a great story. <laughs> now, of course, the role that changed your career, am I correct in this, came in Steven Spielberg's yes. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Definitely. He played Marion Raider. Yeah. Love the twist of Indiana Jones, played by Harrison Ford. You have a great audition story there as well. Tell us about that. Um, I think Stephen had seen, I'd done three films at that point. I, I did Animal House that John Landis directed. I did a film called The Wanderers that Phil Kaufman directed, and he was one of the writers of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then I'd done a third film called A Small Circle of Friends that Rob Cohen had directed, and he was a very good friend of Stephen's. And so I think Stephen was casting about for, Mar for who would play Marion Ravenwood. Um, they had cast initially Tom Selleck to play the role of Indy, and then he had to fall out of it because Magnum P.I. got picked up and they wouldn't let him out of his contract. So when I first went out to uh, audition for, he wanted me to come and do a screen test. I met him in New York. We talked a little bit. He told me a little bit about the character. And then I went out to Los Angeles to do a screen test with George Lucas there and, and Steven Spielberg. And I flew out with an actor named John Shea, who was a New York actor, and he and I auditioned together. And then they brought in Tim Matheson from Animal House, and he auditioned for Indy. Oh. And um, I think that they were the only two I auditioned with. But you know, every actor in Hollywood, Jeff Bridges went up for Indy. Um, um, 
uh, so many wonderful actors had, had uh, gone up for that role. And you know, Harrison was right there in their backyard. The second Star Wars was coming out, but I think they were a little concerned, like he was playing, um, what's the character's name in Star Wars? Han Solo. Uh, Han Solo. He was playing Han Solo, and they thought, you know, he couldn't, they knew they wanted to do multiple indie films, and they were doing multiple Star Wars films, so I think they were a little nervous about him doing, doing both. So, um, uh, but in the end, you know, they just, they just said, no, he's, he's the one, we should cast Harrison. So they cast me, they cast me in the role, and um, a couple weeks later they cast Harrison to play Indy. And how long was production for that? I think it's about five months. Yeah. What was most challenging? I think the whole thing was challenging for me. I had never, I had never done a film of such scope. And um, when it, we flew to London first, and I mean, I was like Alice in Wonderland. I mean, we were on these incredible sets that the British um, uh, production designers had built, and they were just magical, the Well of Souls, all, you know, all of these incredible places. My bar in Nepal was on the, on the London set. And, um, and then we were gonna go to France to shoot a little bit in the Nazi, um, uh, where they where this, they park their submarines, which they can't get rid of. A couple of companies have gone bankrupt trying to blow up these old Nazi bunkers, and they can't. They're they're so the walls are so thick they can't successfully take them down. So we went and shot there, and then we shot for a couple of months in Tunisia, um, uh, out in the desert on the edge of the Sahara in August. <laughs> and you have to work with with a lot of snakes. How did you manage that mentally? Um, you know, I don't have a particular fear of snakes, thank goodness. Um, a lot of them were what are called glass snakes. There were 6,000 snakes. Oh. And a lot of them were glass, what they call glass snakes. Excuse me? 6,000? 6, yeah, there were on the set, 6,000 snakes. And they would bring them on and just fill up this huge, I mean, the set was probably the size of, you know, this room, if you take out all the chairs. And um, they would just fill the whole thing with snakes. And there were, there were some dangerous snakes. There were some pythons who, they don't, they're not poisonous, but they'll bite the living daylights out of you. And they have just, you know, fierce teeth. Were you ever bitten? I wasn't bitten. I would just walk away. I mean, if I saw a python coming towards me, I was like moving in the opposite direction. But seriously, how do you prepare, I mean, mentally for that? You don't prepare for it. There's, what could possibly prepare you for it? <laughs> And then there were cobras, and the cobras had, there were, there were ambulances on both sides of the set, just outside the exit doors, and there were cobras that were kept in sort of like boxes, and they were handled very carefully, and they were put in um, plexiglass boxes when we shot with them, so the cameras well, were not close to the cobras, because you can't detoxify a, a cobra. You can get them to bite an apple, and they'll they'll release their venom into the apple, but they immediately start making venom again. So we had to be very careful with them. There was anti-toxins on either side of us. And the worst thing was that they had built my dress, that white dress that I wear. They had built like 12 of those dresses in the United States, and they'd been sent over to England. And for some reason, they didn't put it together that there was gonna be a lot of fire on that set. Like he's constantly setting fires, and I've got to, torch, they were highly flammable, oh. and there was something about the fabric that the, whatever they tried to fire retard them with, it disintegrated the fabric. So I was like, just like a human torch. <laughs> so not only did they have the toxins, the detoxins on either side of the set, they had me, they had people standing by with like fire extinguishers in case, in case and oh. <laughs> but nothing bad happened. <laughs> Thank goodness. Did you know that you were going to have to deal with all of that when you accepted the role? No, you never think about these okay. things. You know, on paper, you know, on paper, a room with snakes all over the floor, it's just not what you read is actually. You know, you just don't picture it the way it's going to be at all. Well, after that, you had several movie roles. You returned to theater, then back to movies, including Scrooge, Challenger, Malcolm X, and The Perfect Storm. Is it difficult transi transitioning back and forth between theater and, and film? 
Is, or is that by design? I, you know, I think it's really good for me. I don't know how other actors uh, deal with it, but I really liked it. Well, I started out in the theater. I love working in the theater. And um, so if there was, you know, I just would look at the roles and look at the plays and the director and think, you know, is this a project I really, really want to do that I, you know, feel like is something that I, I would really grow and learn something from. and. It didn't really matter to me whether it was a play or a film. And um, so it was nice for me to go back and forth. They are very different in terms of how you work and, and, and all kinds of things. But, but uh, I think that I grew to really love that difference. In 2016, you made your directing debut with a short film, A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud, based on a short story by Carson McCullough. I saw that today. Yeah, so compelling. This was, this film was shown at over 50, uh, 30 film festivals internationally and won numerous awards. Why did you want to do this film? You know, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really resisted. I, I had people for years saying, oh, why don't you direct a film? Why don't you direct a film? And I was like, oh gosh, it's so much work and there's so many people involved. And, and, and then I was sitting with uh, somebody I had worked with in the theater, he had produced a play I directed and produced a play I acted in. And he kept saying to me, he actually produced the film you're going to see tonight. His name is Brian Long. And he kept saying to me, why don't you direct a film? And I kept saying, no, I don't want to. And he said, well, if you did want to, if you did want to direct a film, what would you want to direct? And I, and I just blurted out one day, there's this Carson McCullough story that I love called A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud. I loved it forever. It would be a short film. It has just a couple of actors in it. It, it takes place pretty much in one location. And it would be, if I were going to do a film, which I'm not, <laughs> this would be the kind of film I would want to do. And he, he just kept kind of bringing it up. And finally, I said, Okay, why don't let's do this? So he, you know, finally we just decided, and then I thought, oh well, we'll never raise the money to do it. And then, sure enough, we were able to raise the money to do it. And then over time, I was getting really excited about doing it. And I and I cast in the film some of my favorite actors that I've I've worked with in the theater, um, and this young boy who uh, um, was just amazing, and and I had a wonderful time doing it. So. There, there you go. <laughs>